Hi, everyone, and welcome to another Wu University event. It is a pleasure to be here with you tonight. I am Dr. Stephanie Wu. I am the founder of Wu University, and I'm really excited about this event tonight. So it is my pleasure to introduce Dr. Isa Hanna, who I have had the pleasure of, of meeting just a few months ago. Dr. Hanna went to medical school at the University of California, Davis, and then he did his residency in ophthalmology at Pennsylvania State University. After that, he continued on to a fellowship in ophthalmic pathology at Mass Ioneer at Harvard Medical School. So he's obviously incredibly smart and, and very, very appropriate to be able to give this type of information to us tonight. In 2012, Dr. Hanna moved back to the West Coast to join the nation's top medical school at the University of Washington, serving as both a premier ophthalmologist and professor of ophthalmology. And he has taught over 150 ophthalmology residents and fellows, and he was awarded Teacher of the Year, which was voted by his residents. Currently, Dr. Hanna is the region's only Stevens Johnson's and Grapper's host disease ocular specialist in this area. He works at Wellish Vision Institute in Las Vegas, Nevada, which is also where I live. And that is how I met Dr. Hanna. And I have actually seen this presentation before because he presented this to the local society or local doctors here. It is a fabulous presentation. It is so hard to make opioids interesting, even though a lot of us need it to maintain our licenses. And there's a reason that over 900 people have registered for this event. So thank you, Dr. Hannah, for being here and uh, really excited to hear from you. All right, fantastic. Um, so first off, you know, we like to start these talks and tell you I, I don't have anything to disclose financially, unfortunately, but um, such is life. So you wonder how possibly an eye doc, you know, would have anything to say about opiates. Um, well, it kind of has something to do with this place. This is Harborview Medical Center. It's in the heart of downtown Seattle. And I spent the last uh, 10 years working there. Um, if you don't know much about it, it's a level one trauma center <coughs> where we get uh, patients uh, to catch all, you could say, for about five different states. In fact, I was getting international referrals um, from like the Philippines, um, other various islands um, for some really serious stuff. Um, part of my role at the university was in education of the fellows and of the residents. And, you know, um, as you're there, you do get some administrative roles. So um, if you're wondering why I'm on their website still, because that was one of my first kind of jobs was designing that. What are we going to talk about today? Well, I hope to impart on you um, a greater uh, sense or a greater sense of uh, what it's like um, to, for patients to, um, you know, go through some really um, tough situations and, 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 and show you um, toward the end of like really where, where do opiates play a role for um, in eye care? So the course objectives, of course, you know, cause it's a CE, it'll be kind of outlined, but what I'm gonna share with you is just my patient experiences. They're just people like us and, you know, they go through some rough, uh, rough times. Um, so an outline form, you know, we'll talk about the opiates, we'll talk about the opioid epidemic, um, I want to try to get a little bit of an understanding about, you know, ophthalmic and periocular pain and just really a, a, a greater sense of your role and responsibility when it comes to these folks that need it. Um, I do like to um, uh, start off with a pretest, and that's kind of, you know, my, the educator in me. Um, pretest really is just, uh, we, I'm going to throw out some cases and some questions there, and you just try to answer it to yourself, and we'll see how you do, do toward the end. Um, this presentation um, is a collection of various patients that I've had over the years, um, you know, and they've agreed to share uh, their experiences with you as medical providers, so you learn from them. Um, so first case, um, this is a gentleman who uh, flew to us, uh, life flighted in um, from um, a, a few, a several miles away. 
Um, he's a 27-year-old male, and as you can see, he is uh, involved in um, some severe facial trauma. I'll just try to point out what's kind of going on here. So uh, he flew out the window of his uh, car. He was unrestrained and uh, face first into a pole. If you could see his nose is uh, on this side over here. If you could see my mouth, it should be attached to here. This is his eye. Uh, this, this right here, this white area is some bone and his orbit is directly connected to his mouth. So he is definitely missing some tissue. So question, opiates or true or false, really? And just try to answer this to yourself. So opiates are necessary to treat this patient's pain acutely and up to one year after injury, true or false? Just think about it and make a mental note. Next question. Gabapentin will work well to control this patient's nerve pain. True or false? All right, next case. This is a, a young male who was uh, doing some work on his car and the, uh, the, the radiator fan flew off um, and you could see it fractured his frontal bone, um, fractured his lid, fractured his globe and his uh, uh, zygomatic arch. Most patients with similar injuries require an average of two weeks of opiate treatment, true or false? All right. Now this gentleman here, this was a box cutter injury. He was, uh, his eye was closed by the on-call team. Um, you could see the stitches there. And this is uh, actually when he went back in uh, for surgery um, to remove the lens with me. Um, you could see his lens is open. Um, it's white fluffy stuff in this area here. Question. Most or statement, true or false. Uh, most patients with similar injuries require an average of two weeks of opiate treatment, true or false. All right, another case scenario. So this was an um, Asian male who uh, was uh, flown to us from the um, Canadian border, US Canadian border. Um, he didn't speak the language. Um, he was uh, undergoing a, a brief psychotic episode where he tried to self auto enucleate. So basically tried to rip out his own eyes. Opiates are indicated in the acute management of this patient, true or false. All right, everybody's seen, uh, most of you guys have seen these, uh, this, this type of scenario here. Those are other um, cases may be um, um, a little um, unusual for you to come across, but here we've got a, a, a patient with a corneal ulcer. Opiates are indicated in the acute management of this patient. True or false? All right. So now that we did our pretest, we're going to get to the first part of this talk. And it's really just to talk about opiates. Um, before you can even really start talking about opiates, we, sh we should really define what the schedule of drugs means. So um, there are five schedules. Um, schedule one being unique out of all the other schedules is um, uh, drugs that um, you can't prescribe and they have no medical use. Now, um, as you're increasing from schedule one all the way up to schedule five, the uh, potential for abuse decreases. So, uh, for example, like when you start going into uh, like schedule two, there's a medical use um, and all the way up to schedule five, um, you've got something like what's on the screen here, which is Robitussin AC. You know, there is a medical use for it and the potential for abuse is very low. Um, sure, you could probably chug a bottle of this, but there's other avenues that people find to, you know, get themselves um, you know, high. The list of scheduled drugs or opiates is, is long, but fortunately for us, you know, there's uh, co nine commonly abused narcotics. Um, of these nine co uh, commonly abused narcotics, I'm going to review the most common ones, the ones that you're more likely to see in your clinic 
um, patients are taking are the more uh, likely ones that you're more commonly uh, likely to uh, prescribe. So let's start with codeine, all right? Um, codeine has uh, formulations that are made up of, uh, you know, in the schedules of two, three, four, and five. Street names goes by Captain Cody or Cody or Schoolboy. And um, what you might see more often is maybe the Tylenol with codeine. Um, the roots uh, for, um, to get into the body, um, you know, is via injection or swallowed as the Robitussin AC or the pill form, Tylenol with codeine. Uh, methadone um, is a Schedule II drug only. And as you see later in the discussion, um, it's primarily used for um, uh, tapering or uh, withdrawal symptoms from um, drugs like heroin or other uh, abused uh, narcotics like fentanyl or uh, the other opiates. Street names include fizzies, amiodone. Um, uh, some people, they mix it with ecstasy. You might hear chocolate chip cookies. Um, uh, brand names is uh, methadone and dolphin. Again, injection or swallowed. Oxycodone is probably the, one of the more common ones. You know, it's uh, ubiquitous. Uh, you go to a dental procedure, they'll offer you this. If you um, fracture a bone, they might offer you this acutely. Um, so even in the hospital, we call them perks. Um, that's how common they are. Um, the uh, two formulations really that are um, that you that you'll come across is the oxycontin. That's its pure form. Um, and Percocet, that's its combination with uh, Tylenol. Um, even um, though they are pills, there's people find ways to get these injected um, or um, snorted. Um, hydrocodone, um, again, schedule two, three, and five uh, variations. And this is another popular one is Vicodin. Um, many of you might've even been offered this after a dental procedure or a little uh, minor procedure. Let's move on. So how do opiates work? Well, you've got the muse receptors, the kappa receptors, and the delta receptors. Um, these are primarily situated on the uh, central nervous system and the peripheral nervous system. When we're talking about central nervous system, um, I want you to think about the brain and the midbrain, and of course the spinal cord, but uh, more importantly, the midbrain and the brain. And when we're talking about the peripheral system, um, the effects are primarily in the GI and also the skin. So although the mu, kappa, and delta receptors, they share similar properties in the sense that like uh, when, the recept uh, when, the, um, when the drugs or their metabolites bind to the receptors, you'll get some analgesia. Oh, my, you'll get some analgesia and you can see that. They do, the muse, I want to point out to you, do a few other special things. Like, for example, um, it's responsible for making you feel really good. You know, that's that sense of euphoria. Um, it's also responsible for killing you when you OD in, in the, in, with the respiratory depression. And that's the midbrain portion um, of its effect. Um, one of the more dangerous um, parts of this as you can imagine, is the reward and reinforcements that it, it gives you. Um, so not only does it the, do these drugs make you feel good, but they also give you a sense of accomplishment. Um, and like all receptors, if you're constantly hitting these receptors with, um, um, uh, uh, if you're trying constantly binding these receptors, um, the body will upregulate and produce more of them. Um, and that's, that's really where you get um, uh, into trouble. For example, one of the well-known um, consequences of being on opiates is tolerance. Now, here's a chart that I pulled out of a, a study done by uh, Peronis and Woods, where it demonstrates um, uh, tolerance. So they took reyes monkeys and they found a way to um, you know, measure pain tolerance um, or effect of opiate by, um, you know, they do something to their tail and they'd kind of look at their, uh, their, their physiological response. But the point of the slide, what they did 
as you could see on the orange, they were giving a baseline of 3.2 milligrams per kilogram of day morphine to a monkey or a group of monkeys. And uh, the orange or the purple, they were given, they doubled that dose and just give that to them at baseline. So as you started um, giving, um, uh, let's say five milligram, an additional five milligrams per kg, um, going up on, on, on the x-axis, you could see that the, the percent effect of the drug was less for the guys or for the monkeys that were um, having the higher basal rate. Um, you couple that, uh, you couple the tolerance with the sense of dependence, um, really, because, um, you know, when you're stopping these drugs, you're getting these horrible, incredible uh, withdrawal symptoms, and your your brain just becomes locked into this phase. You know, uh, your judgment's poor. Um, you, uh, you 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 start um, kind of a, you start feeding for these drugs, and you're just in trouble. In fact, um, the original pain that you may have started taking is secondary. Most people report. Um, when trying to stop opiates like heroin or any of the prescription drugs, the worst thing possible are the symptoms of withdrawal. Um, you're, you're, you're just the pain um, your body suffers, not just uh, physical, but psychological. Um, the opiate withdrawal timeline is kind of interesting, and I like to review this slide in a little detail so you can kind of get an idea of some of what these people feel. So 72 hours after your last dose, uh, you're starting to get some physiological uh, um, symptoms with the chills, the fevers, the body aches. Um, diarrhea is because you know, your receptors were uh, in the gut, right? We're always active and cause constipation. Um, insomnia, you're losing, you're up all night. So you can imagine after a week of this, right? you're tired, you're not thinking clearly, you're, you've got the worst aches of your body, you're irritable, you're nauseous, and anxiety from lack of sleep, um, and you get depressed. So a lot of these people, you'll see photos of, um, you know, um, recovering or peep addicts, like homeless addicts, um, laying in their own feces, because they just can't get up, you know, they just feel horrible. So what do you do? You know, um, how do we how do we get people off of these drugs? You know, if you're so psychologically and physically in pain, well, traditionally, and then um, what we've done is used agonists or partial agonists, and these are just drugs that bind to the same receptors. However, the dosage for these drugs are um, like Q day, so once a day, so they have a longer effect. You don't have to give them as frequently, and they don't give you um, some um, some of those other effects like the euphoria and whatnot. More um, newer mo uh, modalities for tapering people off of um, 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 or for getting people um, out of the uh, withdrawal phase is uh, drugs that ta target the glial cells. So like the microglia and the astrocytes and these oligodendrocytes. Um, more recent research in the biochemistry behind this is that they, they form in like, they, they work to, um, in these feedback loops and in inhibitory pathways. So you, you'll probably start hearing more in the future about um, combination drugs com or combination therapy. All right, so the epidemic, what do we have to say about that? So um, this is a picture um, that was in the, you know, the, the paper in, this, um, in Seattle. And this was a park just around the corner from my house where you know, I would walk my dog. And this was not like um, a pile of needles, for example, that they raked up. This was just like one spot behind a bush. In fact, um, just, you know, um, it's not uncommon for when you go step outside your house or if you live in the downtown area to see these things scattered all over the place. Um, speaking of downtown, um, you know, there's a very uh, large homeless population. And this is, this is a few blocks away from where I lived. 
um, and you, you'd notice um, some young people and uh, lots of young people actually, you know, who are uh, mentally uh, impaired and, uh, you know, just kind of laying around and you wonder yourself, why can't they just get jobs? What's going on with them? Um, this is a very, um, like, if you see this picture, it's very easy to kind of figure out what happened here. You know, this guy, well, he's dead, dead you know, he's high, he's just kind of passed out. But it's, it's a lot harder to kind of recognize, you know, um, these drugs being abused um, by younger folks. In fact, recent statistics, you know, in 2020, um, would show that one out of seven high schoolers, and yes, these are high schoolers, this is uh, freshman year, one out of seven high schoolers is reported misuse of opiate prescriptions. So it stretches kind of far. Um, if you look at the numbers, um, although impressive, you know, they are impressive, right? You, you see people here, 1.6 million people with, uh, you know, had some opioid disorder in the past year. Uh, 50 people, 50,000 people tried heroin for the first time. Um, you know, you got a 1.6 million people uh, misused prescription pain relievers. However, although somewhat impressive, it's not huge. And you wonder what's the big deal, right? Well, it's a huge financial burden to the system, right? So we like to look at it in terms of societal costs to healthcare, the criminal justice system, and the workplace. And you can see from 2001 to 2016 how these numbers jumped, right? From 11.8 billion to 78.5 billion. Now, just to kind of give you an example, you know, the healthcare burden, right? I'll throw this question out. How do you treat a corneal abrasion? Well, you know, eye drops, right? So it depends on how bad it looks, right? You might just do artificial tears or you might throw on like an antibiotic like ofloxacin or some people like prefer to give an ointment like erythromycin. However, what if you're spending your day like this? You know, um, in fact, these patients, you know, you give them drops, they either lose them or just don't take them because they're like this the whole day long, right? Um, another point is they don't even present with the corneal abrasion, they'll present with something like this to the ED, right? You know, corneal ulcer. But then again, how do you treat a corneal ulcer? Eye drops, right? So um, these addicts, when they come to you with a simple problem like this um, to the ED, um, it's kind of a challenge. If you convince them to stay there, you know, to take the eye drops, because really they're not going to take the drops on their own. Um, you're lucky if they're there for less than 12, 14, 24 hours, they leave, you know, even if like real serious medical conditions. In fact, there's a protocol we have, like if we can convince them to stay long enough, something simple like this that you'd be able to treat most of your patients with just eye drops, we end up having to give them a Gunderson flap. Um, in fact, most patients um, that come like this, you try to give them drops, they'll come back, they'll leave. Um, the, you know, you never even see them. In fact, the more common presentation of a corneal abrasion is a, is a perfed corneal ulcer where you've got panendophthalmitis. So you're thinking cost now, right? So Medica Medicaid averages about $18,000 per ED visit, just an ED visit. You know, the guy comes in, shows up with an ulcer, you give him drops, he leaves. That just costs the system $18,000 there. But it builds up because if you show up like this, right, not only are you looking at the ED procedure, but if you've got panendophthalmitis, you know, you, you, this person can die if you don't do something about it. Sometimes they still want to leave. So you have to get like, um, you have to get uh, emergency, like um, you know, declare them mentally unstable, whatnot. And you kind of hold them, force them in, and you end up with getting in, uh, you end up getting a nucleus, a, a nucleation. So it's not uncommon for um, these patients to, you know, either ignore the problem or you offer them treatment, they leave and they come back when things are really, really bad. This is an eyeball, um, you know, just like we took it out and we're just kind of reviewing it 
for anatomy's sake, um, that muscle there is the inferior oblique. That's the optic nerve. So just for like kind of, there's your superior oblique. It's got a more of a tendinous thing. But anyhow, I think you got the point. So how do you treat an itchy eye? Well, pad a day is pretty good. I like pad a day. Um, it was a prescription drug that now, you know, you can get OTC. Well, if you've got some impaired judgment like this fella, he injected his eyeball with heroin. Um, he initially, um, as uh, I think it was his mother initially took him, you know, his eyes looking really bad. She initially took him to uh, an outside hospital where they got a CT scan. And, um, a few hours late, you know, they transfer him to us, of course. Right. A few hours later, when we repeated the CT scan, when he got to us, it had, the infection had spread so fast. It was already behind his eye. And this is kind of interesting. So you, in the first pane here, you see a little gas bubble. And over here, you see a larger gas bubble. And oh, what's that? His lens had dropped. So he had, um, uh, he had um, an uh, anaerobic, which was uh, producing gas in his eye. And this fella, he wanted to leave. He was, in fact, insisting that he could see out of that eye. And his eye was fine. He didn't have any problems. We had to get a court injunction to keep him in there and, 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 and um, so we could treat him. Otherwise, he, he, he would have died. So that was the health care cost. So societal and, uh, uh, and the justice system costs totally separate. So this is a picture, um, you know, from King, King News, King County News, just a snapshot, um, you know, tent city or not tent city, but just an encampment that was forming up by the um, one of the school grounds in the in the local area. Um, you know, next to kids where they play, you know, you've got tents, right? What's what's going on in the tents? Well, various assaults, drugs. Um, in fact, you know, the, the, the parents were trying to kind of get this cleared up. Um, however, you know, there's various reasons it didn't. It ended up uh, resulting in the assault of an 11 year old girl. And this is uh, from uh, my ring camera at the house. Um, it, was an, it was a nightly, well, not a nightly, at least once a week, we'd have somebody come up to the door, trying to open the door, come in. Um, crime was really kind of getting out of control. This guy's trying to steal the ring camera. So how do we get there? Or how did we get to this point? Well, um, back in the late, 90, late 90s, um, you know, the pharmaceutical companies, um, you know, they reassured the medical community that, hey, these drugs, they didn't have really any uh, potential for addiction. And at the same time, um, philosophically, you know, um, in the, in the, from the medical community, we wanted to, you know, there was a sense of compassion. We didn't feel like patients, if we had good ways to treat pain, people shouldn't have pain. Um, and uh, when I was in medical school, this, um, uh, they had, this system was kind of being developed, right? The scale pain or the, uh, the, uh, the, the pain chart, right? You know, you'd ask patients, you know, what, what level of pain do you have? And you tell them zero is no pain. And uh, a scale, uh, uh, when you get to 10, you'd kind of try, you'd tell them, well, 10 is like if you're ripping your arms out and like, where are you at from this? from no pain to feeling like your arms are ripping apart. And, you know, on the, in the ICU post um, uh, trauma floor, people would tell you, oh, doc, I'm probably like around the four, you know, but I'm okay. By the time I made it to a, my intern level, you had fellas like this showing up to your emergency room on call. You know, you'd ask them, you know, what's going on? He'd tell you, oh, my stomach hurts or something, and some rather something. Um, what's your pain scale? And he'd tell you 10. And you say, so you feel like someone's ripping out your arms? Yeah, doc. I feel like my arms are getting ripped out by my stomach. Uh, and, then, you know, what do you do with that, right? So you got your million dollar work up there, you know, liabilities at the hospital. And these patients, you know, you find nothing. Some docs, you know, would just ignore them. 
they turn their back, you know, they, and then they would just hop hospital to hospital until they found someone to give them what they wanted. At the same time, um, you know, there was a different breed of doc that started making the news, you know, the doctor who figured out, oh, man, you know, we can make some money out of this. And they were, it was like a total cash business. You had these physicians that were really just dope dealers, cash business, you know, making millions of dollars a year, getting people hooked on uh, painkillers. And at the same time, you know, every dentist, every ophthalmologist, every surgeon, you know, they're just prescribing this stuff. Your grandma's cabinets are probably have something that looks, you know, that's a Percocet or Vicodin or something like that. And, you know, uh, you, know you had uh, local government, you know, trying to deal with the issue. And sometimes, you know, they, they don't do the right thing, or they might think they're doing the right thing. And the situation just kind of gets a little bit worse. Meanwhile, media is catching on and you know they sensationalize a lot of stuff and then you you might even remember this picture of like the the couple that was kind of pa that was passed out in the car with the kid and with media throwing it in your face just about every other week you know 2016 comes around it's a hot contention selection year and then poof you got yourself an epidemic all right part three let me get a sip of water all right, pain in and around the eye. So let's talk about that a little bit. So this patient, um, I believe it was around 2013, um, he came to us one night um, and he reserved, uh, received an interesting type of injury. He's a, a handyman, a mechanic. He was working around um, pressurized hydraulic fluid and whatever it was in, it kind of exploded. So it gave him a thermal injury, so second to third degree burns on the surface of his face and his eye. Um, it gave him a blunt injury to the eye, and it also gave him a chemical injury to the eye, so combined mechanism. Um, initially, we, you know, we had to give him some kind of um, narcotic aid to calm him down and get him out of the pain. So in the acute phase, we did give him some narcotics. Um, but one thing I do want you to notice is we have uh, the lid spec in this eye and we asked him to look to his right. So he's um, abducting his eye there. So uh, he's got a frozen globe essentially just because of all the swelling and shock to the muscles. Um, on closer inspection, we saw that he has a total eight ball hyphema. So let's review what happened here so the chemical the chemical injury to the eye is probably a little bit more severe than the thermal injury because you know people close their eye the chemical gets in there they close their eye um you know so you're you're less susceptible to burns um but the thing that we worry about the chemical injury depending on the substance is the level of penetration into the eye and um, uh, one of the more important things is injury to the limbal area from the chemical. The blunt injury itself, we worry about the blunt injury because if you look inside the eye, right, um, on histolo histology, you'll see that the trabecular meshwork here, right, where the, uh, um, the aqueous filters out is very fragile, so that can get injured. Um, you know, the iris tissue itself is, is, again, very fragile, and there's lots of blood vessels in the eye. You could get iris tears, you could get dissections um, through the ciliary body. Um, so you can get uh, blunt trauma can cause uh, severe injury to those parts of the eye. And also um, the lens, right? So you can get a traumatic cataract, you could get um, injury to the zonules and you could lose the lens. Um, I've not ever seen a rupture lens from a blunt injury. I'm not saying it's impossible, but it's very, very rare if it were to happen. Um, the zonules here, you could, um, you know, this is a super magnified thing. Um, it's a scanning electron microscope, super magnified, but they are fragile. 
Now this is his eye after we did an AC washout and he'd already, we'd already, I've, I already gave him a, a limbal stem cell transplant. This is in the, um, the healing phase. So it was an autologous uh, lim limbal stem cell transplant. But what are we seeing here? So this is his blue iris. And what is this dark pigment there? And what's going on down there? Let's take a quick look. So if you get irritable dialysis, right? And um, if you notice on the bottom here, you got a pigmented layer, you know, um, that I, if it's a severe aerodialysis, as in this case, um, the iris just rolled up. Um, that blunt injury also caused total zonular loss all the way around. In fact, his lens was hanging onto his iris and it was just fused there because it was just a, it was an inflammatory adhesion. Um, so let's review our, our, our pain situation here, right? So we needed to give him um, dilated acutely to kind of calm him down. And we needed to give him um, some opiates as a bridge, just only two days, believe it or not, until all our other medications kicked in, right? So there was some surgical debridement done um, to remove, um, you know, any necrotic or pro-inflammatory tissue. The um, steroids helped um, calm down the inflammation. Cycloplegia is key with any type of um, like se severe eye pain, because um, that's really where you're getting a lot of that discomfort from. Um, is just a ciliary spasm. And IOP meds, of course, because this fella, his IOPs on presentation <laughs> were like in the 60s. Um, high IOP, as you know, could cause pain, brow pain specifically, and nausea, vomiting. Um, and of course, like part of the pain protocol is counseling. You always want to kind of tell your patient what to expect. Um, when they're going to start feeling better, what's the course of the disease and why you're trying to treat it. But if you look here, right, we're not just treat, we're using pain meds to bridge the patient um, with the treatment um, that's going to get the eye better. Because really, that's how you get rid of the pain is by getting the condition better. Um, so you got an eye like this. How do you get the vision better? You know, I think I'm, I'm just, yeah, you know, I think it's interesting. So I'm just going to kind of share that with you. So by the time I got him to the OR for his um, lens extraction, you know, he'd had uh, his cataract that totally turned white. Um, most lenses, actually all lenses, they're kind of oblong and flat. However, because this guy's lens was uh, lost, doesn't have any zonules pulling it and giving it tension, on the, um, at the equatorial plane, his lens was like a round ball. And, um, you know, you, if you talk to surgeons, you know, who have um, experience with these um, intumescent lenses, we call them intumescent because there's a lot of fluid that fills up these lenses. They're just pressurized, they're ready to explode. So how do you get something like that safely out of the eye? Well, let me do a capsulorexis. Um, the interesting thing, the part about this is, um, you know, my boss here, I overheard him talking to a, um, a patient where, you know, we're, you know, when he's counseling a patient about femto, um, femto laser cataract surgery, he was talking about the femto being the fastest capsulotomy in the world, you know, that it happens, the capsulotomy uh, or the entry into, you know, peeling away the lens capsule to get into the eye, um, took only one second with femtolaser. Well, I'll argue that this capsulotomy is actually much faster than a second. It's a blink of an eye, and I don't have a video of it because you don't see it, but I'll explain to you, kind of. So, what you do with the capsulotomy, you could think of um, the lens capsule as being like a skin of a grape. And you just kind of peel it around this course, you know, so in a controlled environment, it's very easy. You can kind of just peel it off, right? But when you've got an external force or internal force just wanting to explode outward, um, right as the second that you puncture the lens, you're going to get a big tear. You're going to just, it'll just radialize all the way around the thing and you lose your lens. So um, I devised this technique um, um, to 
uh, for these type of lenses where that takes an account um, of uh, negative vectors. So if you've got a vector going in, you want to have a vector go, or uh, if you've got a vector going out, you want to have a vector going in. But the objective is to try to get this thing to tear in a circle. So what I did was I figured out if you have, if you, if you can grab the capsule and you have a, um, a quick tug in this angle, you're counteracting the outward force. And what happens is you get a nice quick tear. So in fact, this was just one tug gave you that entire circle. So now you're stuck with a lens that's floating in the air. Um, thankfully, there's a lot of smart people. They devised instruments like this. This is a capsular bag hook, and this is a capsular tension ring. So in this uh, video, I'm showing um, a demo of um, the capsular tension uh, or the capsular bag hook um, uh, holding up the lens. In normal cataract surgery, um, you know, you do what's called a hydrodissection. You're, you're flushing fluid between the lens and the lens capsule to dissect it. But in these type of cases here, because, you know, if you, if you have a higher, if you induce a high pressure into the AC, the lens is going to fall. So what I was doing there was with the little instrument, I was um, trying to dissect the lens out, dissect the lens away from the capsule. This is a, that was an irrigation instrument just to remove a little bit of um, the fluffy uh, lens material out. And this is the, again, a Drysdale trying to just manipulate the lens. What I'm doing in this uh, video is I'm making room to insert that capsular tension ring, which is um, fixated to the eye. So instead of the zonules, you've got this tension ring, which expands the bag and, and then provides some stability so that you can um, treat, uh, treat the eye as if it was a little bit closer to normal. Because you can't leave, um, you can't just leave the bag um, unsuspended to the iris um, and put a lens in there. So that's the uh, capsular tension ring going in. A few frames down the road, um, you know, it does get stitched in place. I uh, didn't include that in the video. Let's see. And then you can just introduce, again, after things are fixated, you can introduce the standard um, equipment that you use for cataract surgery. So this is the patient um, about six months after that video, um, if you notice his eye is nice, white, and quiet, um, I'd given him a corneal transplant at this point. Um, he has a lens in the bag, and this is one of the better visual outcomes that I've had with corneal transplant, even given his injury, and this patient at this date of the photo was 2025, and pain-free. All right, let's talk about this gentleman. So he's uh, the one, if you remember, who was um, unrestrained in a motor vehicle, um, was ejected and faced to a pole. So after we cleaned up his face, um, you know, just cleaned up the area, we, we put him back together. This was immediately post-op. This was on the day to discharge. Um, uh, but it's about three weeks after uh, the initial injury. Um, this is um, his orbit. Um, you know, he underwent um, uh, a series of um, surgeries after this with me to kind of reconstruct the orbit. But I show you these pictures, right? Because I just want to give you the example of the severity of the injury. And really, like, this is, this is a bad situation, right? So how much narcotics did he need? What, what kind of pain medicine did this, probably the worst thing you can imagine happening need? Well, it was about a two to three week uh, taper post-op, you know? And then uh, we bridged him on with some oxycodone. And, um, you know, by the time he left, 
You know, he was just on Percocet for maybe just a just a couple just a couple weeks. You know, I wouldn't say more than a month and some change, something like that. Um, really, a lot of that um, conversion just came from counseling. Um, you know, the initial pain is from a lot of the swelling and injury to the bone and, and, and to that area and so just to the shock, but that goes away pretty quickly. So really, he did not need narcotics more than about, you know, uh, three to four weeks. Um, he did stay on Tylenol for some, some months. And what was kind of in, uh, important um, to note is in um, the nerve pain. The nerve pain in these um, situations could be significant. And gabapentin, which is a neuroleptic, is really, really good for that. You might have encountered that for your post-terpetic post neuralgia patients. And it really works well for something like this. Excuse me. Let's see. My slide's not advancing. Oh, let's see. All right. So here's another case I'd like to go over. This was a patient um, that I'd seen, and this is uh, his on, on day of presentation. I took this photo um, about four weeks prior he'd gotten dry cement in his eye and he went to an eye doc and, you know, it was unclear really the story, what happened, but he came to me, he was on Durazol and he was popping Percocets left and right. He was in severe, severe pain. It's a little hard to tell what's going on here, but his um, lid was fused to his globe you know, his cornea is hazy, so his vision was about 2,400, and his uh, epithelium was already conjunctivalizing. So you see that he had a significant amount of limbal stem cell loss, and his cornea was kind of growing over. So let's kind of review um, what mechanism of uh, injury and mechanism of pain that's going on, right? So cement is an alkali agent. And if you recall, alkali agents, bases um, are more dangerous than acids because they penetrate deep, deeper into the tissues, right? Um, it's uh, very toxic to the limbal stem cells that live around in this area. Um, and if you've got enough alkali agent, it'll go all the way into the, into the AC, swim around in the AC, destroy your iris, destroy your trabecular meshwork. So this patient, his IOPs were like about 45 at the time, maybe a little higher, I don't recall. Um, so it's unclear if it's because of the Durazol or because of the, um, the, the chemical injury to the eye. Um, but severe discomfort, likely from all the inflammation and ciliary spasm. Um, trabecular meshwork, again, very fragile. Um, uh, the cells that live on the trabecular beams are... Uh, get easily, easily damaged from um, uh, the alkali agents. So how do you get an eye to not get like this in the first place? Um, well, irrespective of what you're getting, what um, chemical you're getting in the eye, whether it be ketchup um, and it's causing some irritation, some hairspray, gasoline, um, um, hydrogen peroxide, um, spray paint, whatever, the first thing you're going to want to do is irrigate the eye. So these are Morgan lenses. I'm not a fan of these, but the ERs are fans them, are big fans of these. Um, I don't like them because um, they sit on top of the eye and it could cause abrasions. I'm more of a fan of manual irrigation. So if you're at a party, someone gets soap in the eye, you're going to just tell them irrigate, 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 all right? If someone gets whatever it is, you're going to want to irrigate, 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 and then get a good exam. Um, early surgical debridement of necrotic tissue is important, um, especially if for the more severe agents um, because the, the chemicals sit in there and it causes long-lasting injury. So you end up like this. So now you got this eye. What do you do? You know, well, you can't keep the guy on drugs forever. Um, so you go back to our philosophy here. You try to treat the underlying issue. Um, you don't want him to end up like this, right? You know, with the limbal stem cell loss um, and just dead nerves in the eye. So what do you do? 
you take them to surgery. I do like to operate. And by the way, I do like doing easy stuff too. So if you're a local optometrist thinking, hey, I'm going to send Dr. Hannah all my hard stuff. I do like hard stuff, but I do appreciate getting easy stuff too. So what am I doing? I'm injecting epinephrine with Lido into the scar tissue. Um, makes it easier to dissect. It bubbles it up. Makes it easier to dissect out of the eye. Um, and it also does help in uh, blood control. You can see the, the bottom part of the eye is not as affected. But this is interesting here. I want you to pay attention to the cornea. Look how much scar tissue grew over the cornea in just that short amount of time. Look how far back that goes. So that's all cornea. That's where his limbus should be. But it was obliterated by scar. By the way, you know, the conjunctive is very, very frail, right? Now, this tissue here, this is all, that's tenons, which is also kind of soft and smooth, but this stuff had turned into leather because of just the, 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 the base agent that um, penetrated down in there. And this is his upper eyelid that I'm pointing to. And this is that adhesion that was holding his upper eyelid to his globe. And this, uh, what I'm holding in the, or in the, whoever's holding in the forceps there, that's his tenons. And that should be smooth, but it's like leather. And this is nice, snipping away the scar from his eyelid. Now his eyelid looks like an eyelid. And all the scar tissue is removed. Well, we can't just leave it that way. But his eye looks like a kind of almost looks like a normal eye again. Let's see. Let's fast forward and show you. Globe is fully freely mobile. So this is Ambio Dry. So it's Amnion. I'm sure you guys have heard of amniotic membrane. I was an early adapter of that. Um, I've been using it for years and years and years. So this is a dry formula. It's uh, similar to Procara, but Procara is like uh, frozen. It's fresh frozen tissue. Um, here I'm using to seal or tissue glue to um, um, put a barrier between the eyelid and um, the uh, conjunctiva that I'm, I'm harvesting from the other eye. Now I'm harvesting conjunctiva from these two sections of his fellow eye because that's where the limbal stem cells live because he's got a limbal stem cell deficiency. If we leave him um, without stem cells on that other eye, he'd end up like that one white eye that I showed you before where he's just got a cor vascularized cornea. So this is a sutureless sur surgery, all tissue glue. We've got the limbal stem cells in place. And I'm just gonna do, I'll just forward to the next uh, section. So this patient did great as well. So what was his post, or what was his pain management protocol here? Well, he was on narcs for a really good amount of time. So I, and in my opinion, it was misused. That's not how you wanted to do it. Um, I've had similar injuries and that I'll show you where people, they didn't need to be on narcotics more than about four days. Um, the key is early irrigation and early surgical debridement for uh, you know the, uh, the severe injuries. Um, one thing I do wanna point out is that there was no consequence and there is no consequence from stopping cold turkey, especially after only a month of use. Um, again, we treated the inflammation, cycloplegia for the ciliary spasm, um, any Tylenol for excess um, discomfort after, um, uh, you know, his, uh, in his post-op period. So he wasn't given any prescriptions for narcotics for me. Um, this is uh, probably the most severe alkali injury um, that I had. Um, this was a young lady, um, aged about 24. 
um, who had a bilateral injury. The other eye looked just like this. She was making soap um, using potassium hydroxide um, um, in, in a blender and the, the blender just kind of exploded. Um, I wanna show you a couple of things if you can see my mouse. So the gray tissue here, this was all necrotic eyelid. It penetrated deep to the underside. So she ended up losing this tissue. The gray here also, this is all necrotic tissue. She ended up losing that. Um, one thing, whenever you see just limbo whitening, that means all the stem cells are lost. And this is in our acute, this was in a few hours after um, the injury. And the total cornea was white, so it penetrated deep. In fact, um, I wish I could show you what I saw when you, you could still kind of faintly see the AC. Um, basically, the base had just um, coagulated like uh, her iris pigment. There was like uh, black, um, uh, there was like black part particles floating around in her AC. And there was a fluid wave between the layers of her corneal stroma. I have a question for you guys. Let's see if you if you know. What do you think this brown thing here is? What's that brown stuff? Think about it for a little bit. I think in a in a in a chat room of eight hundred people, I think one person probably well, a handful of you probably got it right. I know you're smart folks, but that brown thing there that's um, that's coagulated blood. So the base penetrated deep enough to um, to infarct and destroy the blood vessels of the inferior rectus. And so she had these brown stains all around where the recti implant to the eye. So question, how much um, pain or how much narcotic do you need for this type of eye injury? Let's think about it. Well, you need it a little bit mostly for like around the skin and eyelids. She was only on narcotics for um, a little bit over a week, but the eyes, you didn't need any for it because the eyes were totally numb. All the nerves had died. So that's something else to think about, right? Um, here's an open globe injury. This was a steering wheel to the face. Um, and, you know, unfortunately this fella um, had a total, um, open globe. Um, this is clotted blood. And this, this type of eye has like zero visual potential. Um, open globe protocol is the same whether you have visual potential or not. Um, what I do for my patients is prednisolone four times a day. Um, I like ofloxacin because it's cheap four times a day. Atropine BID for that ciliary spasm. So you see we're um, prophylactic for infection. We're treating inflammation, ciliary spasm. Um, I'm a fan of BCL for surface uh, issues. So if there was any corneal stitches that required, I'd put a BCL on there. They're very comfortable. And everybody gets moxie for seven days. Um, for uh, severe open globe injuries, everybody also gets 12 tablets of Percocet. Um, with the instructions, uh, one to two tablets every four to six hours is needed. Most people with even something just like that, they don't even go through the 12 tablets because I talk to them. I tell them, look, you know, you're going to feel really bad. It's going to hurt for the next couple days, but you're going to feel a lot better. And then I tell them, especially if it's a blind eye, you know what I mean? I tell them, well, you know, if you're still having pain, especially a month out, the treatment for a blind, painful eye, well, it's in, it's in enucleation. And a lot of a lot of patients, they kind of want to avoid that. And they want to, even if their eye is blind, because after we put it back together, it feels a little normal. So this is a video of uh, enucleation on a post-globe injury. I took this video for the residents. Um, you know, just one of their teaching videos. I have a resident assisting here. Um, here, what I'm doing, you'll see I'm isolating the um, inferior rectus. You, know, you do a blunt dissection. That's a Jameson hook. Oh, every ophthalmic tool has a funny name or it's named after somebody. So the resident here is the resident's holding the uh, Jameson hook and I'm letting the resident cut the muscle. 
And you know it's a resident because it's not a smooth cut. There's a couple little snips and they're a little nervous and they're a little jittery back and forth. But what we do is we isolate all four muscles. There are actually various techniques. This is a technique I'd like to teach the residents because it's a little bit more difficult technique just to kind of get their hands in the OR. And this is like a first year ophthalmology resident. You can't mess up a totally messed up eye you're taken out. So you let them have their fun here. So there's just snipping the eye out. Look, there we go, muscles free. What we do, why we isolate the muscles, at least for this type of procedure and this technique is we, we, um, we suture those muscles over an implant. And this is the attending job. I always called it the attending job. It's where I get to snip the nerve crappy instruments, hospital. Those are point, point threes, forceps. They don't grab too well. Um, those are curved scissors, snipping the nerve and let's go. There you go, free. So if you notice the orbit, there's not too much blood loss, but there is some. Uh, what, I'm, uh, what I'm gonna use is what's called a dental roll to apply pressure and then it stops. If there was a medical student in the room, I tell them to put their thumb in there and apply pressure. So it's kind of like a joke on them too at the same time. That's an orbital sizer to figure out what size implant we're gonna put in. And I usually try to shoot for a 22 millimeter implant that gives them the best um, uh, cosmetic outcome after, and that's what this fella got. So post-op for an enucleation is the same thing. You know, I, I don't give people more than 12 tablets. I never, I don't, I can't think of an instance where I've given anybody for anything more than 12 tablets of Percocet if they're going home. And maybe once, like, you know, I could probably count on my hands, um, fewer fingers that I've actually renewed Percocet. And I've seen some pretty gnarly, crazy stuff. So here's another open globe. Um, question is, what is the immediate post-op plan for an eye that suffered a similar injury? Well, it's open globe, right? Um, what happened to this guy? So it was a severe enough blunt injury that he did get some zonular loss. And you see, you see some stitches here, right? Up and up where this, um, these dashed lines are. So the limbus is a weak area of the eye. And if you hit the, hit the eye hard enough, you're going to get a rupture at the weak points. So this guy, this was a blunt injury that actually ruptured the eye, he had some zonular loss and his iris, again, like that other fella, stuck to his lens. So he's got like a nice wobbly lens. You can see part of the capsule where my arrow is pointing. So there's zonules here, but there's no zonules there. Um, but anyhow, it's an open globe, right? So you're gonna treat it with prednisolone, fluoroquinolone, um, prednisolone for the inflammation, highly inflamed eyes, atropine for, um, you know, ciliary spasm. And again, for any surface discomfort, a bandage contact lens is great. Um, how do you restore this guy's vision? Well, very similar to the other fella, except this guy, he was in his uh, 70s, so his lens was already dense. So you have the, um, the uh, capsular bag hooks in there and this one it's a just be a chop you do the chop technique um and you can see what i'm kind of doing but it's you're going a lot slower because you can lose the lens in the bag then it's a retina procedure um and you do want to kind of give them a lens you got what well, you want to give them the best visual outcome you can so you just slow down your cataract surgery um it is a lot more delicate procedure than just standard cataract surgery, but you can see how dense that lens is. It's kind of like stones. A lot of docs wouldn't try to do this, but I've had a lot of experience with these eyes, so it's easier. Um, I'll move on. The only thing you'll see is me putting in a capsular tension ring and suturing it in. Interesting to me, maybe not so interesting to a, a lot of other folks at this hour. Um, this is him post-op. Um, you can see that he has a lens in the bag. It's fixed to the eye well. He still has some sutures here. What I did for him um, 
after I removed the sutures, I let the astigmatism settle. I used the femto machine to treat his astigmatism. Um, after the sutures were out, he had about 11 uh, diopters of astigmatism. I did. I used the laser to do some uh, really tight and large arcuates. This was actually part of a um, study that I did. Um, I was able to reduce his astigmatism from 11 to about 1.2. It was stable for about six months, and then it reverted to about two diopters. Um, he's currently in a scleral lens with a 2020 vision. Um, one thing that I'd like to point out is people who lose their irises, right, are going to be photosensitive, sensitive to light. Um, however, interestingly, after several months, they're not anymore. So like this guy just used a scleral lens, didn't need any artificial iris, which I was on part of a trial for those. I'm not a fan. Um, sometimes there's, uh, you know, the um, those... Uh, um other contact lenses that kind of just give you a pupil those are good for some folks but you know you leave an eye like this after several months they're not photosensitive anymore and they see great so this guy was 2030 scleral lens so um one thing that i found to be curious was pain management in traumatic eyes after they had a second surgery so in this case was cataract um most cataract surgeries, you're not going to have pain. You, you know, you might have some kind of discomfort related to, you know, an abrasion or some surface disease, um, post-op period, but these people are quite painful. So this is the only situation in any cataract surgery where I'll, I'll, I'll give them uh, one to two tabs of Percocet, and that's only once. But again, um, uh, I'll increase the dose of steroid for the inflammation because that's where a lot of discomfort's coming from. Those uh, post-traumatic eyes are highly inflammatory um, eyes there uh, and cycloplegia for the ciliary spasm. Let's see. Oh. All right. Now, this is one of um, the rare conditions um, you may have heard of um, called Stevens-Johnson. So in Stevens-Johnson syndrome, um basically the skin and it's a percentage you know of skin that's involved um anywhere from like zero to you know near 100 but the worst cases that i've had were probably in the 80 to 90 percent range where the skin it just sloughs off not only does it involve the skin, but it involves the mucosal surfaces. So like mucosal surfaces that we're interested in, um, aside from like the mouth and, you know, upper airways, nose are the eyes. Let's see, my slides aren't advancing, but so this is what an eyeball looks like in acute Stevens-Johnson syndrome. So there's like a protonaceous exudate, his conjunctiva and all the epithelium just totally sloughed off. Well, you can imagine these patients are in severe pain. So not just from their skin, but their face, their eyes, their throats, their mouths. So when they're in the hospital, of course, they're on some narcotics. And that's where narcotics really play an important role in medicine is for quelling really, really, really severe pain in acute phases. But what do you do for the eyes? How do you fix these people's eyes? Well, you do an amniotic graft. So this is an older technique that I used. Um, and you can somewhat see this tissue here. So this is a large piece of amnion that I reflect, that I sutured to the outer eyelid margin on up here and then down here also sutured the other piece of the uh, large amniotic membrane. And then you can see these bolsters up in the fornicule area. So those bolsters, are um, protecting the um, suture from eroding through the skin, but they're also holding 
the amniotic membrane in the fornices, such that the entire ocular surface from the um, the uh, con the conjunctiva, uh, the palpebral conjunctiva to the bulbar conjunctiva to the cornea, and um, from the inferior to the upper eyelid is just completely totally covered uh, with the amnion. This is kind of nice. There's also like a mix of drops that I like to throw into this. Um, but they end up looking like that after only one treatment. Um, unfortunately, these people's uh, issues with their eyes persist. Their skin, actually, when they heal, so let's say two months out, their skin looks fantastic. You can't even tell, basically, that they went through this. Unless, like, if you're a darkly pigmented in individual, like African-American or Hispanic, Dark, dark skin because uh, pigment builds up, but over time, so give them like a couple of years, it'll fade out. But if you're lighter skin, you can't even tell anything happened to you. But with your eyes, you can develop melts. So you get these um, really um, unfortunate gaping melts. Um, and the melts uh, is part neurotrophic and and it's really stimulated by uh, the systemic inflammation. So you could see in this picture um, a little divot forming in this patient. Um, this particular patient, um, she was a monocular. Um, she uh, developed uh, Stevens Johnson um, from um, a um, anti um, psychotic uh, medication. And um, she was in your, uh, she was a monarch prior to her Stevens Johnson because she tried to kill herself and the bullet passed through her globe. So now, you know, when she's uh, um, have Stevens Johnson syndrome and you got one eye and you start developing melt, what do you do? Well, I'd like to show you these slides. So this is anterior segment OCT. This was her on the day I admitted her. And this is a, a, a week after. And this is a picture I took um, of that same hole kind of healing up after um, and during a, another admission. So what did I do? Well, these, these um, situations are really tricky. Um, like their melts are not responsive to topical drugs. In many cases, even topical medications can uh, make these melts progress and even perf. Um, one of the nice things you could see um, in this panel, we had the epithelium growing in. So how did I get the epithelium to grow in? Well, you gotta be very gentle to the eye surface. This patient, even a contact lens, she couldn't tolerate. Or, or because just the pro-inflammatory nature of this disease, a contact lens in her eye, you know, wouldn't would set her back up some. So what I did was just a tarsorophy, simple tarsorophy, old school, give her a temporary tarsorophy, stitched her eye. I, in fact, it was a um, type of tarsorophy that you can open and adjust to exam. It's kind of a cool technique. Um, and I put her on really, really, really high dose um, IV steroids um, three times daily. And this is what we ended up getting, a good eye. Um, after this episode, you know, after she fixed, uh, after we got her eye um, fixed up, you know, she was 20, 25. Um, I do have to mention she did develop a cataract. I did her cataract and then she was 20, 25 without scleral lens. Um, so pain management plan, well, it's plus or minus, right? Um, so for the eye and some patients, there are, have some element of neurotrophism. You don't really need really any narcotics for those that don't, you know, you could use it as a bridge in the inpatient setting, but really what we're doing is we're treating the underlying issue. And that's like a reoccurring theme in my slides. You got to treat the reoccurring or the underlying issue. Now, this is a patient um, who had a 5-7 palsy. 
and he came to me as uh to the clinic he actually came to the resident clinic you know and i was staffing it that day and they said hey dr hannah come see this guy you know he's got an open globe injury so i walk in there and his friend's like yeah man this guy's in pain you know let's get him some medicine i look at his eye and he's got a five seven right so so seventh nerve um is allows you to close your eye right and the fifth nerve, well, that allows you to feel stuff. And, you know, without uh, five, you lose the neurotrophic uh, growth factors to the cornea. So a bad thing happens, right? So you've got exposure because you can't close and you don't have the growth factors, so you can't heal. So you perf if you don't do something about it. So this guy was perfed. Nice, large hole. So you could see his uh, uveal tissue is prolapsed through there. So what type of pain medication is indicated for this patient? Little quick question. Well, the answer is none. He doesn't need any. Um, in fact, I had a patient um, that was referred to me a couple of weeks back here. Maybe the doctor's online. Um, she, a young lady who had a brain tumor resection ended up with a five seven. Um, uh, she was referred because she, you know, had a abrasion that was non healing. Well, I did a temporary tarsorophy before I can get her into the OR do what I really needed to do, and I didn't even need to inject her eyelids because the five nerve does control your upper part of your face. So let's review a little bit. Um, the cornea. Main reason, because I want to show you how I fixed this. Like, how do you fix something like this? Well, a cornea transplant is not a good option because you do need um, to have good coverage. You need to have good um, healing component to the eye. Um, so what do you do? Well, the cornea, if you remember, is consists of epithelium, right? And then you've got Bowman's and then you've got the stroma here. And then you've got decimase, which is a basement membrane, keyword basement membrane. And then you've got the endothelial cells, right? Let's look a little closer. So the keratocytes, which are in the, uh, uh, the corneal stroma, they kind of behave like fibroblasts, really. And that's what they're doing. They're laying down collagen. Um, the decimase, we did say it's a basement membrane. Remember that word? And then endothelial cells here, well, they've got an interesting property, right? They don't, um, they don't divide, right? So if there's an endothelial cell loss, what they do is they migrate over decimase and cover up the hole. So I took this information and I took some ambio dry. And let's look at ambio dry, right? It's got epithelium, right? Kind of like the cornea. It's got a basement membrane kind of like decimase, like the cornea. And then it's got this little layer here of loose fibroblasts, again, kind of like the cornea. So this was the first time I did this. And actually, I'll show you the results. This dude had a huge hole. Um, I removed those epithelial cells, um, this, these epithelial cells. I laid it down so that the basement membrane um, patches that hole where the endothelial cells could migrate over. I pulled up some conjunctiva just to give some blood supply to this situation to migrate more, um, you know, migrate oxygen, um, uh, more cells uh, that help in the reconstitution of the cornea. I laid another piece of amnion with the, with the, uh, with the fibroblast part inwards. Remember fibroblast part inwards. And then I popped the BCL on. So I didn't do any sutures. I used um, all biological glue. And then after uh, just a couple weeks, no more hole. This is a slit lamp exam. Um, this patient did quite well. Ended up doing a, a lateral, uh, a semi, uh, mid to lateral tarsorophy just to kind of save his eye, you know, until we figure out what else, what next to do with them. But again, pain management plan, well, you got to know what you're dealing with, right? He had a five, seven, no pain. Back to this guy, right? Our famous uh, friend from the border. Um, 
so autonucleation it's a lot more common than you think um i would see this condition i would say on average once a year sometimes twice a year um there might have been one year where i didn't see it but it's it happens um not only do people try to pluck their eyes out um some people they try to cut them out with box knives box cutters um all kinds of weird things um what are we looking at here well um his globes are protruding through his orbits um you can see part of his um inferior uh his inferior oblique here um one of the more dangerous things of this so he wasn't successful obviously but is the tension that you get on the optic nerves so the optic nerves are usually have like the sinusoidal pattern there's reduplication of it so that um you know when you move it there's not tension on it but in the back of the globe is usually flat and round but here you see this y shape and whenever you see that y shape you know you're getting some ischemia to the nerves And in this photo, you could see severance of his inferior rectus and just blood building up behind his eyes. Um, this is, was his initial visual fields, which surprisingly opened up quite a bit. You could see a somewhat of a clover pattern here. Um, this is his EOMs about um, four weeks after the injury. Let's see. So, what type of pain medication is indicated for this patient? And another good, yeah. So what type of pain medication is indicated for this patient? Think about it. See what you guys are come up with here. None, no pain. So there's a few categories that I've um, come across where people, they don't need pain medication. So neurotrophic disease is one. Um, psychosis is another one. And this is uh, well documented and it's kind of interesting. For some reason, people in acute psychosis with their eyes, they don't need pain. Um, a, good hand, uh, a good handful of elderly patients um, that receive, uh, that get corneal ulcers or get corneal um, or get um, open globe injuries, they have like absolutely no pain um and patients with dementia those are the four groups of people that you should be you know you should kind of say oh well we don't need to really kind of worry about pain um well, this guy was not a psychotic patient he was hit by a with a wrecking ball and kind of lost his eye and had some facial fractures yep he did require some pain medication um for his bone pain more or less is what he needed it for and that was for a two-week span after that was just tylenol okay here we go more familiar territory stuff that we kind of run into um in the in the average clinic the corneal ulcer all right so corneal ulcers can have many sizes, shapes, and forms. And they could, you know, be as severe or as simple as something like this, right? Now, the big question is, what type of pain medication is indicated for this patient? Well, I would argue that none. Um, in fact, I would say that pain medication is contraindicated because in um, ulcers, when I treat ulcers, sometimes, actually often, especially the more severe cases, right, the first thing that's going to tell you if someone's getting better is when their pain starts getting better. So like, I'll bring them back the next day. And my first question is, does your eye feel better? Because when I look at the eye, it'll look the same. Maybe some there's a little bit less inflammation, but their eye will start feeling better. They'll say, oh yeah, doc, it's a little better. I was able to kind of sleep a little bit longer, you know, and, and whatnot. I'll bring them back the next day. The ulcer might still look the same, 
you know, but they'll be like, oh yeah, I'm a lot more comfortable now. Then I know I'm on the right treatment plan, you know. Um, you might ask, what about cultures? Well, cultures, a lot of the times they, they're unyielding, you know, they'll come back negative. Sometimes um, things are so severe that you want to know if you're on the right track before a culture comes back. So I never um, prescribe pain medications with even the most severe ulcers. What I do do is, well, I treat with topical antibiotics. Um, even within the, it depends on how close I'm going to be following them up. It will determine and how and if uh, how suspicious I am for a fungal, whether I'll start a topical steroid right away or wait for a day. But always cycloplegia. Um, depending on the level of discomfort, I'll pop a BCL on there and also the level of follow-up. And of course, counseling. So they'll need to know, like, you know, the severity of their disease, what to expect, um, what to, like, you know, let me know or come back sooner for. Um, here's one to throw at you. Now that we've kind of reviewed a whole bunch of gnarly stuff and, you know, made the point over and over of um, how we like to approach pain and, and eye, severe eye conditions. But is there any ophthalmic condition that would indicate long-term opiate use? What do y'all think? If, if, you, if this was a room, I'd probably hear a bunch of people say no. And then I'd tell you, well, yeah, there is. So this fella um, had a basal cell carcinoma that um, I, I speculate started on his lower eyelid. And, you know, he was prescribed an ointment by his family doc that he kept using and refilling and never went back. Um, and the basal cell carcinoma um, is, can be quite ag aggressive. So he had um, a, a type that's called morpheiform or sclerosing type that invaded through his tissue all the way down. You could see his face a little bit larger down here, invaded through his face. Um, it eroded his eyelid, invaded through his eye, did not penetrate in his eye because basal cell doesn't typically penetrate through the eye, but traveled along the nerves all the way back to where his brain was. So this is somebody who, when we when when he presented, oh, you could see the missing tissue here. This was like an infected area, loss of tissue. It was pretty gnarly. This is not the first guy that I saw like this. I had two cases like this in my career. Uh, but anyhow, this fella um, was referred to hospice. So yes, narcotics um, do have a role in ophthalmic um pain in the long term but it's only like you know just if for palliative reasons like this guy's not gonna live long you know this stuff is already back in his brain so how we treat him is with oxycodone dilated um uh, a neuroleptic like gabapentin is really good for the nerve type pain antibiotic for the infection and prednisolone um, after about uh, two weeks of therapy, he was um, a lot more comfortable, and um, I didn't follow him after that. So provide a role. Well, it's really just being excellent clinicians like yourself, right? Um, you you got to know what you're treating. So really coming to the diagnosis, um, you know, you got to know what you're treating and know how to kind of manage it and um, know when to send something when you don't know what you're managing, you know what I mean? Um, one of the nice things about uh, being in medicine is more likely than none, there is someone around that can help you figure it out. Next, oh, give me one second. Next is really just kind of understand the mechanisms of eye pain, right? If it's surface related, you know, think bandage contact lens or lubricants. Um, um, if there's uh, inflammation, um, not in a, not only um, topical steroid, but think, you know, ciliary spasm. So um, um, do some cycloplegia. 
Um, if there's an infection, of course, there'll be inflammation. Think antibiotics, think steroid. And in conditions where the IOP um, is an issue, of, you treat the IOP, right? So if you understand where the pain's coming from, you know what you're dealing with, you treat, you target those. Let's see. Um, the other thing is you got to know when to prescribe, right? So in a lot of my cases, like if, if, if it was a discharge, like a lot of these cases, these patients are coming to you really uncomfortable in the emergency room or, or whatever setting it is. And you can't even examine them. They can't even open their eyes. So you give them something. Uh, not only does it help with the pain acutely, but it kind of relaxes them, allows you to examine them, allows you to get to the diagnosis. Um, there is a post-operative role for narcotics, as you've seen um, from the most severe case that was less than a month. You know, they were on some kind of narcotic for about a month, that dude with the face split open, to the more commonly severe issues, still very severe open eye injury, which is only just a few days of narcotic. Um, another reason to use narcotic is to bridge for therapy, like a, or to use as a bridge until the therapy kicks in. Um, another thing, you know, I hope to impart is to really kind of know how long to prescribe for, you know, um, because if you understand what's going on, um, you could tease out whether um, someone is trying to just get more narcotics from you or maybe they really are in pain and you're, uh, you're not treating the underlying issue correctly. Maybe there's a misdiagnosis and this happens, you know? Um, you know, the guy's pain is still going on. He's on antibiotics. Maybe it's not a bacteria, maybe it's a fungus, you know? So it, it helps kind of direct your therapy. Um, for post-op cases, I've never had to see, uh, for all the stuff that I showed you for any post-op thing, I've never had more than five days, rarely. Um, a, a bridge, typically, until therapy kicks in, is about two days. And when I'm talking bridge, this is for... Um, this is for like that severe ocular surface reconstruction case um, uh, or that one guy with this, the bad blunt injury and we had to give him a limbal stem cell transplant. We had to do his cataract um, and waiting until those kind of therapies kick in, you know, it's just, just a couple of days. All right. The other thing is you got to know when not to prescribe, right? You got your drug seekers, um, a little bit more complex is the former addicts in treatment for dependence. Um, that's a very common scenario that you'll see in the larger uh, metropolitan areas. They do have pain. How do you manage their pain uh, without giving them narcotic? Well, you treat the underlying issue. There's Tylenol. Um, there are special teams even at these larger hospitals um, that um, pain management teams that can help you figure out ways if you if you don't know all right post test all right guys you ready for the post test see what see what we learned here all right okay opiates are necessary to treat this patient patient's pain acutely up to one year after injury true or false I should be hearing a unanimous sound right now through this uh, imaginary room of 1,000 folks. Gabapentin will work well to control this nerves, patient's nerve pain, true or false? So obviously no um, for the first one, right? This guy only needed it for about one month and he was fine on Tylenol after that. Gabapentin really helped this patient out because that's one of the one of the longer lasting issues is the nerves regenerate. Most patients with similar injuries require an average of two weeks for opiate treatment. True or false? Oh, this one's a little trickier. I'm being tricky. So not two weeks, usually less than a week. Okay. Usually less than a week. Similar injury, open globe injury, less than a week around a week, less than a week for opiates. This guy, did he need any pain medication? No. Do your elderly, sometimes your elderly or demented patients, um, uh, 
do they need pain medications? In most cases, no. Your corneal ulcer, are opiates indicated in the acute management of this patient? No. All right, well, I hope that I was able to kind of entertain you and teach you a little bit for a couple hours here. Um, I'll let Stephanie Wu take over. Well, that well, was we're doing questions, right? Or yeah, no, like we that. have we have lots of questions that, oh that God, can, oh. we can hope you answer, oh. but I'll let you take a drink of uh, water first. Um, if like you guys questions. enjoyed this event, please register for our next one. It was actually tomorrow on oral pharmaceuticals, which was a very highly requested topic. Uh, but we do have some questions. First question is uh, from Dr. Rebuck. Do you ever recommend CBD oils? Um, no, you know, I don't know too much about it. To, uh, that's probably why, it's to be honest. Mm -hmm. Yep. Mm -hmm. And um, Dr. That, Lamb, uh, uh, yeah. she wants to know if, what's the rationale for psychosis, dementia, elderly patients not needing narcotics? Yeah, I, 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 again, I don't have a good answer for it, but it's just something I, yeah, I've observed. Um, it's odd. You'll walk into the room, the, the elderly lady, you know, she'd have like her post PK eye, like her flap hanging on her cheek and her uvia hanging on her cheek. And she's got a smile. Are you uncomfortable? No, it's not universal for some of those older people, but the demented people, it's almost been universal. Like I, I have no idea, but it's just something that I've observed. And you can tell when people are in pain too, you know, um, so yeah, it's, it's just something real. I, I don't know. Yeah. Well, we have lots and lots of comments coming in right now on how amazing this lecture is and what an incredible presentation. So thanks, Dr. Hannah. We've got a few more questions. Yeah. Ask me uh, a question I know an answer to. Okay. In what cases would you recommend using an amniotic membrane? Oh, there's lots. Like I've used it for even to help me treat corneal infections that where there's thinning. Um, as you've seen in corneal perforations, I do it in conjunctive cholesis surgeries. I do it in like non-healing abrasions. If I do a superficial keratectomy, I put it on to help me heal. Like the possibilities are endless. Like um, amnion, um, like I see it having two functions. One is providing a substrate for growth. So like, let's say in, uh, in the case of pterygia, right? If you're taking out a piece of tissue, you put the amnion in there, like the, the blood vessels and the conch kind of grow into it. Or in that example that I showed you with the corneal perf, it was a substrate for like just the normal eye tissue to kind of grow into it. But also in like dry eye, for example, or like um, surface disease where the abrasion is not healing, what it's doing, it's just helping with the growth factors that are in it. You know, amniotic fluid has neurotrophic factors, growth factors, there's some magical stuff like activating nascent stem cells. So I've used it in all sorts of fun applications and I actually love the stuff. It's been, it's been kind of a gift to us. Yeah, amniotic membranes have like really changed eye care and just what some of the things that we can do for patients. I mean, right. I've got hundreds of patients I use amniotic membranes on it that have, I mean, it's been a world of difference. Some of the people that have had ulcers that really would have left a dense scar, you know, don't end up scarring or get a smaller scar. I mean, it's just right. really amazing some of these stem cell uses. Yeah, yeah. And then Dr. Gallup asks, is there any worry about tendinitis with oral moxie, as we know, with Leviquin? Nope. Actually, even in pediatrics where that is more common, you still give it to them. And I've, we've never had it. And it's um, kind of like one of those things you just do. Um, you're afraid of um, the tendon rupture. Um, and whatnot. And it's just kind of one of those things that's like published, but you still do it. We have never seen it. We just universally do it. Um, Moxie is one of the greatest ocular penetrating drugs. Um, and with all the severity of eye injuries that I've seen over the years, and I've seen a lot of them, and we would get hundreds, I'm talking about four to 500 a year, I've never had an infection from an open eye injury and it's because of moxie. Mm, yeah. Amazing. And in that, yeah. 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 And it, even with that, we have not had any tendon rupture or any kind of stuff. 
and like um, you know the the pediatric docs. So like if you got a pediatric injury, right? They don't sit on our service. You know they sit on the pediatric service, and you tell them the that's what we want, and they put it on there. You know, free of any fear. Yeah, yeah. Thanks for sharing that. That's super interesting. Yeah. And last question from Dr. McLinn, which I'm actually curious about too. What is the biologic glue that you referred to in a lot of your cases? What oh, is that made of? So it's to seal. So it's just like fibrin. So um, it's a, it's a, one of the, it's, it's composed of clotting factors that are derived from human blood. So the same stuff that makes your, your blood kind of stick together and coagulate, turn into like those clots. Remember that clot that was hanging down that dude's face? Yeah. Mm-hmm. So it's purified. It's that stuff purified. Got it's it. Clear, it's beautiful. It's really, really nice. Great. And I'll just end with this comment. Holy cow. I've been in OD for 40 years. And I have to say, these are some of the most amazing slides and cases I have ever seen presented from Dr. Gallup. So yeah. thank well, you, Dr. About, Hannah, yeah. for a wonderful yeah, just, presentation. Yeah. It was just a comment, you know, it was a, it was a, it was a, almost a lifetime of um, clinical experience that I tried to shove in with my, um, you know, experience with opiates and really severe cases. And I'm glad that uh, that doctor enjoyed it. Awesome. Well, thanks everyone. This will officially conclude the CE portion of the event. 